The final score, Wrexham 7, Barnet 5. A game so remarkable, someone should make a podcast about it. This was just silly, really. And before the game, I was suggesting that the figures were useful to give us a context. Wrexham, the top scorers in the division. Barnet, the fourth worst defence in the division, but also the sixth best scorers. And, well, those pre-match stats seems to essentially be an accurate way to look forward to the game because the post-match headline, I suppose, in terms of statistics is that Wrexham have never been involved in a game that involved more goals than this. This ties the club record for aggregate score in a match. That's quite incredible, isn't it? And the last time we had so many goals in the match was in 1934 when we got our record home win of 11-1 against New Brighton in the Northern Section Cup, which is a sort of half-LDV trophy, if you will, or Papa John's, whatever it's called now. This was crazy. I mean, we scored seven goals at home, and yet a lot of people felt a little bit deflated afterwards. And we did that in five goals for the third time this year. Wow. Very strange. I'm going to try and dig into this a bit. Could be a long one. Wrexham made two changes, and they were very interesting. Of course, Phil Parkinson has selected a very settled team so far this season, apart from the Chesterfield match, but he brought two changes in the midfield. One of them enforced on him. Jordan Davis took a knock on Tuesday and wasn't able to take part, uh, but also James Jones was rotated down to the bench. Tom O'Connor and Luke Young starting as, as a double pivot, with Elliot Lee coming in behind the strikers. So I think this is the first point of explaining what happened. We've got this very well-grooved 5-3-2. We've got a midfield trio who sort of work well together. We've got well-grooved, as I keep saying, passing patterns. We are used to what the shape should be when the other side of the ball in different parts of the pitch and in different phases of play. And I think that was the first issue because this is a change because now instead of having that three, we've got the two deeper midfielders and the one higher up to attack. And if I'm honest, this felt like it could be an issue early on in the match. The fluency was not there. It wasn't fluid. And in fact, I would say that there were there were patches of lovely fluent play. But with the ball, we didn't look as good as we have done this season. Or if, when we've been playing well. Having said that, Lee being added to the two strikers meant we had so much firepower that we still scored seven goals. But it wasn't fluent. It wasn't fluid. And it was something of a relief, we thought. When after a very scrappy start, we took the lead. Now, that scrappy start was contributed to by Barnes as well. Dean Brennan, their manager, is not scared of switching their shapes around. And he switched to a quite interesting, quite funky, unorthodox sort of approach. It was three at the back with a holding midfielder, Gorman who was in the middle of everything good and bad Barnet did. Um, and because he was sitting in front, they sort of released their wing-backs to do what they felt like, especially on the left, where Kanu, Idris Kanu, was uh, really, it's positionally, just absolutely all over the place. I mean, that critically, when they didn't have the ball, because he wasn't often in position, but also meant that he was popping up and floating around in all sorts of unexpected places when they had the ball. So I think, Wrexham had an issue because we weren't used fully to the shape that we had compared to the other shape, which now comes, I think, as second nature to all the players when it comes to deciding what to do. And also, Barnett did have players popping up in unexpected places. They played with one striker and a couple of narrow attacking players playing off him, but they would wander around as well. And yeah, I think it's just they were hard to read, I think, in a way. So it was a relief, like I said, to get that ninth-minute goal. Barnes had been really compressing the space terrifically well, and it was hard to get passing rhythm going. But then we struck from a set piece. It was half cleared, but Cluas did well to keep it going, heading the ball back in the danger area. And Aaron Hayden did really well. He brought it down in the centre of the box. It was a real chance, but he showed the coolness of a striker because he let it drop and he just set himself rather than thrash at it and hit a left-footed shot that gave the keeper no chance. He was close in, but he had defenders around him, and it was a good finish. Interestingly, by the end of this game, he'd have 13 goals for Wrexham so far. That's the only one he scored with his foot. 
And at that point, Wrexham started to get a momentum going. Barnet's defence didn't look great, as you might expect from their their record, uh, which was hardly improved today. And they started to make mistakes at the back, and Wrexham started to make opportunities. Ford, a couple of minutes after the goal, feeding Lee, who hit an excellent snapshot in the, from the D. Brilliant save, and not the last one by Laurie Walker, who dived to his left and magnificently managed to parry it behind. Really good reflexes. From the corner, Wrexham threatened as well. Lee was found, and as we saw at Oldham, of course, he's got the capability to make something happen in a crowded penalty area, and he managed to nutmeg his man in the box, but eventually ran out of space as he tried to get past the second one. Wrexham were continuing to push on, and soon there was another opportunity, this time uh, born from an error, Gorman losing the ball, Mullen feeding McFadgen, and he stood a terrific cross up to the far post. Palmer got it well, but couldn't get over his man properly, and headed it over the bar. And there was another opportunity, a cheeky opportunity, after a quarter of an hour. Good thinking first by Mark Howard, who hit an early clearance. Phillips, the centre-back, couldn't deal with it properly. It was just dropped behind him. Isn't Howard good at just dropping long balls just behind the centre-back for Mullen or Palmer to take advantage of? Or, in this case, for the defender to make a mistake, stretching backwards, backpedalling, he could only head it behind for a corner. And then came a glorious moment of audacity. Wasn't that popular with his teammates at the time, mind? Paul Mullen, on his own, sprinted up, spotted the ball up. There was no one really in the box for Axum, but the keeper was standing on the edge of a six-yard box, barking instructions to his defenders, and wasn't looking at the ball, and Mullen tried to score direct from the corner. He tried to curl it in. He hit the side netting, so he was only a couple of feet short of pulling off what even by his standards would have been an audacious goal. But Wrexham, despite the fact that for me the fluidity wasn't really there, were now, as you can hear, creating a lot of early chances. Um, we had seven corners in the first 17 minutes, so the opportunities were there, the pressure was there, and, well, we nearly got a lovely reward when we did find our passing move, uh, rhythm in the 17th minute. A passing movement, which had 14 passes in it, 50 seconds of possession, everyone but Mullen and Ford touched the ball during the move. It was a lovely, patient move, which started with Luke Young injecting some pace into it after he picked up the ball in midfield. On the right, we circulated it across to the left, just very patient, moving, probing, and then eventually Lee clipped a delicious little pass from the left flank to Palmer, back to goal, right side the box, and he managed to flick it over his marker and couldn't quite get there to hit a shot from the edge of the six-yard box, a defender just about managing to bundle it behind for a corner. So Wrexham looking on top after about 20 minutes without looking our best. And then the game turned. Barnet had really struggled to hit their men with their passing, and, and, and throughout the game their passing was very hit and miss, but they had a really good 10-minute spell to turn things around. They started to come at us. They started to exploit those spaces I mentioned. That the area of greatest concern for me was that, okay, we play with our wing backs very high up the pitch. So you're, there's always a chance you can get in behind them. But I think when we played the three man midfield, I think there's a clearer idea of what people's responsibilities are when they're coming back to cover. On this occasion, I don't think it was. And having the double pivot sitting in front of the back three made space either side of the double pivot and round the side of the centre-backs, if, if that makes sense. And those spaces were being capitalised upon by Barnett. They pulled the goal back in the 29th minute. This, though, was down to an error by Aaron Hayden, who had the strangest of games, scored two goals, probably had his roughest game at the back for me, for Wrexham. Long ball forwards uh, by de Havilland. Hayden, on the edge of his area, free header clear, should have dealt with it. I mean, that's his strength, isn't it? But I think he was trying to head it downwards to try and find uh, Luke Young in midfield and headed it straight to Kabamba on the edge of the D and he sorted his feet out quickly and has a powerful shot. I think it also took a little nick off Hayden as he tried to block it, which sent it perfectly into the bottom left corner, hit Howard with no chance. And Barnett suddenly were level, something of a, a shock to everybody in the ground, possibly including them, but they had threatened the last minute, few minutes. And within a minute, they'd carved out another opportunity. Collinge, the right-sided centre-back, who was getting forwards constantly, 
got the ball about 25 yards out and drove it a really a terrific, powerful shot, which was heading inside the right post. Howard, I think, hadn't quite set himself and did well to get down and push it around the post for the corner. And that corner was really badly defended. It, I've got to say, though, wonderful delivery by Gorman, who whipped an in-swinger to the near post. But we really seemed to lose our shape. There was a big gap there, and Pritchard got it well and nodded the ball down from close range, and Barnett were ahead. <laughs> the race course was stunned. Fortunately for Wrexham, when the chips were down, we tended to find a response pretty much straight away. And this time it was from O'Connor. A free kick, 36 yards out. A funny one, actually. Long ball forwards. Palmer jumped and was fouled. The ball fell loose. The ref tried to play advantage. And McFadgen, latching onto it, was fouled right on the edge of the D. But the referee having felt the advantage didn't play out, of course, had to pull it back to the further out position, the, the first foul. I thought this was a bit unfortunate for Wrexham, because it was a bit a long way out for a shoot shot, but O'Connor hit it with power, and it hit Kabamba, who was the inside man on the wall, and deflected perfectly into the top corner, with Walker absolutely helpless, and Wrexham had struck back quickly and equalised. And, as with the pattern would establish, within just over a minute, we were actually ahead again. This time it was Phillips in midfield, receiving a pass from Gorman. Horrible, heavy touch by him. And Lee nipped in, drove forwards, played a nice little pass out to Mullen on the left side of the box. And Mullen came up with a sort of finish that Lee came up with against Eastley on his debut. A lovely, crisp, first-time, right-footed curl around the keeper. His first time, so the keeper didn't have time to set himself. And Wrexham were ahead. And you started to think, OK, we had a real scare there. But now we could push on. There was an instant three minutes before half time as the referee came to centre stage, and he did a few times uh, from this point onwards. Gorman running with the ball, Lee coming alongside him, and then Gorman's arm raised, Lee going down, holding his face. Now, when I looked at the replays during the commentary, I felt 100% red card. I mean, Gorman's movement, he really looked like he was throwing an elbow, and he made contact with Lee looked bad the referee didn't see the as a foul and only gave the free uh and just stopped the game for lee to be treated having looked at it again i think i'm feeling a bit more 50 50 about whether it's red or not <laughs> which still doesn't say the ref got it right i can maybe there's not as much force maybe as i thought behind it maybe you could argue he's just trying to push lee off and because lee is shorter catches him in the face but I, I've I've got to say as well, it's not just an arm out. He does seem to lead as he puts his arm backwards with his elbow. So Gorman was lucky, I think. What came next was the first of a series of strange ones. A series of three very odd yellow cards Wrexham players picked up. From the restart, Lee got the ball back and just pulled off some magic. He got the ball on the edge of his area, nutmegged his man, then skinned another sprinting across the pitch and then ripped a fabulous ball down the right-hand side to Ford. You got the feeling this was the anger in him for not having seen Gorman get punished. And then when Ford won a corner with his cross, well, the next thing we knew, the referee was showing a yellow card to Lee. So I, I assume, having really got his dander up with that skill, he then turned around and said to the ref, well, a comment about the previous decision and the ref booked him for dissent. There'd be more weird stuff for Elliot Swallow, the ref, later on. But the end of the half ended with Wrexham looking to get back on top. Young swept in a cross from a corner. Palmer got up with a free header, headed it on target. Mullen leaned in in the crowded six-yard box and got a little touch about, about a yard off, if that, from the line. And it was blocked on the line and came clear. Um, I think it came off the outside of Mullen's arm, but his arms were tucked in, so it would be an interesting one. I think the ref couldn't see because it was a bit of a scramble. And there was actually another scramble in the second minute of added time as well, as Toza finally got a chance to put a long throw it in and the, landed in the goal mouth, allowed to bounce, scrambled about a bit. But in the end, Barney got it clear, and it was 3 to a half time. And half time felt much more relaxed. Felt like we'd had a scare, like I said, but we got back to, you know, on top again. And indeed, we had a chance very early in the second half to really compound things. Lee driving forwards. Again, nice weighted pass to Mullen. Again, he decides to hit it early. It was struck very well, but it was a bit too straight. And the keeper got down well to save. And then we got a shock. 
because Barnet equalised. They weren't supposed to do this. 51st minute. Again, it's this, it's movement and it's a failure to pick people up in those areas along the sides of the centre-backs, which I think normally the, the wide midfielders might have been covering a bit more. On this occasion, it was Collins, the right-sided centre-back, who suddenly pops up in the right channel, completely unmarked, about 15 yards out. It was a nice little triangle of play down the right, and it, it pulled us around a bit out of position. Uh, McFadden was high up the pitch. O'Connor was gave the ball away initially, and then maybe rushed in to try and make amends when he should have just held his position. It was easy to bypass him with the pass. They were breaking three on two. Clueth was up the pitch as well, having joined in the attack. Clueth and Young were trying to race back and did manage to get back. And apparently we got our shape all right. But there's a player out wide, but Fadjan still hadn't got back. So Clueth had to go out to mark him, leaving an enormous gap between him and the centre of the box. He was out on the wing. He was outside the area. It was a really, really big gap. O'Connor, I think, was uncertain whether to go back and plug that gap or not. I think McFadgen should have done. And as Barnett rotated the ball on the right, McFadgen just stopped picking up his runner. It was Collinge. And Collinge ran into the box, squared it nicely, and Carnu popped it home, and Barnett were level again. Lots of decisions to be made there. Maybe one of them should have stepped out from the back and tried to stop the attack immediately because Rob Hall was the player in the between the lines. He had loads of space. Maybe somebody should have stepped out from the front and just taken him out one way or the other. But we didn't. And we were 3-3 and the crowd were angry at this point. Really angry. In fact, soon afterwards, O'Connor got the ball. O'Connor had a strange game, as we'll get to later. Did some excellent things, but some surprising errors as well. And he dwelled on the ball in the halfway line. I don't think it was a bad thing at all. I think he was weighing up his options. There was still half an hour left. No need to panic. But the crowd went mad at him. Mad at him. I think they were angry about a couple of times they lost the ball. He'd lost the ball. And they really turned. I was quite surprised. It wasn't a Dover atmosphere. This wasn't us roaring back after a shock. I think the fans were really expecting better than this. Um, ironically, within about a minute, Wrexham had taken the lead again. Because again, we struck back well. In fact... We were about to embark on a period of three goals in 5 minutes 37 seconds, or, if you prefer it, four goals in 11 minutes and two seconds. So we did hit back fabulously well. The first one, the one that gave us the lead again, which ultimately we wouldn't relinquish, was a glorious ball by McFadden dropped over the top of Phillips again. Phillips struggling with the ball behind him. Again, though, it looked like it was his, really. But Mullen did ever so. I mean, he's so good at this, isn't he? If a defender lets it drop, he's brilliant. And so he managed to accelerate and get himself between man and ball and make it his when it shouldn't have been. He carried on into the box. Phillips lunged in and caught him. Penalty, no question. Mullen stepped up and drilled it inside the left post. And Wrexham were ahead again. And soon afterwards, oh, we really got a beauty. A free kick given in midfield. It was a good 30 yards out, I would say. So Barnett lined up a wall and focused purely on marking up in the box. And were totally caught out when O'Connor just prodded it forwards and Young, who was also on the free kick with him, just ran onto it, set himself and hit an absolute screamer. His first goal since the end of the season before last. What a hit. 25 yards out. Smashed it. Real velocity arcing into the top left corner the keeper didn't even move i've got to admit my first impression was it must have taken a big deflection but having looked again i don't think it took any deflection i think it was just a fabulous hit by young wonderful stuff the crowd absolutely adored it and then the cherry on top came in the 59th minute corner on the right Young sweeping it in, and there was Hayden to attack it typically at the near post and plant a powerful header into the top left corner. And Wrexham had taken control again, and it looked like all was well. Soon after that, there was nearly a, a glorious goal. A ball cleared out from a corner to Lee about 25 yards out, and he hit it on a, a dipping half volley, a wonderful hit. It looked to be going in under the bar. Superb tip over, a second brilliant save by Walker in order to keep them in the game. Well, I say keep them in the game. You wouldn't have really thought so, would you? From the corner, Young swept it in, and Palmer got it well at the far post, but again being backed into, couldn't quite get on top of his man, and his header just scraped the bar. 
Wrexham kept pressing at this point Barnet really looked like they'd cracked and you wondered whether they was really ship a lot of goals Wrexham got the seventh that's the first time since Andy Morell scored eight go- uh, seven goals in an 8-0 win against Merthyr Tidville uh, back in the late 90s last time he scored seven in the league was 1995 against Rotherham and it was a Oh, it was a lovely, lovely goal. Lee getting the ball in midfield and just dribbling between two men superbly, then cutting inside a four, driving forwards. Palmer made a run for him. I don't know how Lee saw him, but he found him one-on-one with the keeper. It was perfect weight on the pass. He threaded it through the eye of a needle. Uh, I think the highlights, the camera angle doesn't do full, full justice to it. But honestly, he was running right to left. Palmer's running left to right. There's two defenders in between them. And he somehow times that pass to utter perfection with perfect weight and slides it into the tiniest of gaps just as it appears to put Mark Palmer one-on-one. It's sort of, I don't know, particle physics and mechanics with all the pieces moving around and Lee, like a genius, just works out that instant when the chance is there and strikes Palmer it's it's a lovely ball a perfect weight like I said not only because Palmer's always getting there first but because the keeper and if you're on the video you can see the the end product the keeper is committed to it he feels he can get there but he can't he comes out Palmer's there first the keeper can only spread himself and hope and Palmer lovely finish as befitting such a fine assist just dinks it over the helpless keeper and Wrexham have got seven goals with 25 minutes left magic pure magic that was and someone in front of me starts shouting we want 10 and it didn't feel absurd at all Barnet looked on their knees but huge credit to Barnet at that point I was saying I was a bit concerned about them and how their season would go if they keep being like this without the ball. I'm not saying that I'm taking that back. I'm still wondering if they are going to have a difficult season. But I tell you what, they got some guts. They've definitely got some guts. And they almost immediately should have pulled a goal back. Hall on the right-hand side, dinking in a cross. Kabamba attacked it in the six-yard box. It went just over his head, but he'd taken the markers with him. And de Havilland popped up unexpectedly on the edge of the six-yard box. A tightish angle, but with you know, a lot of the goal to aim at and hit a rather weak affair which looped gently over the bar. A poor finish. He, he should have scored, frankly. Halfway through the uh, second half, Wrexham <laughs> carved out another chance. Ha- uh, glorious play by Young. The ball bouncing really awkwardly high to him after a toes of throw had been cleared. And he somehow managed to swivel and volley the most difficult of pass perfectly to Toza, who got into the box from the flank and tried to repeat what he did at Oldham. Didn't get this one right, though, and slapped it with a lot of power, but absolutely no placement way over the bar. Wrexham started to make changes now with the game apparently safe. Bryce has made a welcome return after injury, replacing Anthony Ford, who's put in a good shift. And James Jones came on with 12 minutes left to replace Lee, who went off, as you might imagine, to a standing ovation. But the game started to change. Barnett was still showing a bit of threat. Shields came forwards to substitute and snapped a shot from 15 yards across the Howard, who really did well to hold on to it. And in the 76th minute, they pulled the goal back. Hall again doing well in the build-up, feeding it wide. Winter coming forwards on the right, punched the first time flat cross to the near post and Kabamba who timed his run nicely side foot it coolly into the bottom right corner 7-4 still surely nothing to worry about six minutes left Carnu gets the ball on the left goes driving forwards and hits an absolute screamer nothing anyone could do about this one and a rocket which goes into the top right corner a glorious goal and suddenly Wrexham are rocking. It's 7-5. There's six minutes left. And there's going to be a chunk of added time. The ref actually adds on seven minutes of added time. And we're looking a bit concerned. Especially when a long ball is played towards the edge of the box. Hayden fails to deal with it. And Howard does ever so well to race off his line. And just beat Shields to it deep in his penalty area. The referee was about to take a, a bit of a role as well. He'd already, as I said, given that strange one to Lee, and there were two more very poor yellow card decisions to come. Firstly, Luke Young gets a yellow for... Uh, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm biased, but I look, look at it on highlights. The most gloriously timed sliding tackle. He slides through and 
really cleanly wins the ball. It's a super tackle. The referee blows his whistle and Young looks horrified then just because he's penalised him. He really can't believe it when the yellow card comes out. So that was one. And then, with two minutes left, Paul Mullen gets a, on the wrong end of a shocking decision. The ball's clear to the halfway line. Defender takes a touch, a poor touch. Mullen thinks he can nick the ball, but slips, slides, and I say slips into his man. There's no intention in it, really clearly. And astonishingly, the referee, after correctly giving a foul, because it, he has stopped the man from going forwards, albeit accidentally, books him. Really scandalous. Almost um, uh, instantly after that, the ball's played to the edge of Barnett's area. Mullen, racing back, makes an excellent tackle on the edge of the area, but it was a hard tackle. If he'd misjudged it, he'd have been in trouble. And I think that's why, almost instantly again, Phil Parkson took him off and brought Sam Dole beyond. Mullen looked disappointed to be taken off. He was, of course, on a hat-trick. But I think Parkson was wise because Mullen... Uh, uh, had his, his blood was high and he might have made a second unwise tackle. I say that, no, really, let's be honest, it would have been a first unwise tackle <laughs> because both the ones he made, one was an accident, one was a good tackle. But, you know, the referee was making us feel edgy. And Barnett were making us feel edgy. Wrexham did have a chance two minutes into the seven of added time when Clueth stood the ball in and Palmer got it well but headed the ball just over. But Barnett then came back and with three minutes of the added time left had a real opportunity. An error by Hayden who tried to feed it forwards to Toza. It was a poor pass and Toza was tackled. He couldn't really do much about that. The ball was fed into Kabamba on the right channel. He took a touch into the box and drilled it with real power. A great save by Howard to push it away for the corner. And Wrexham then saw the game out. In fact, we could have got an eight with the last kick of the game. Young sweeping in a corner, clue with a really difficult stooping header at the near post about eight yards out. Wasn't that far off target as he tried to feed it inside the near post. A crazy game. A mad game. And like I said, afterwards there was a weird mood because it was like great, but scary. Unlike Dover, where we roared back heroically, this was a game we won a few times and struggled to hold on to. And well, there's a lot, like I said, to pick out of. I, I feel fundamentally the first point is that we, we tried a different shape in midfield and we weren't as well grooved in it as maybe we would become if we'd worked on it a bit more. I think that Phil Parkinson, I've said this before, is a very good uh, training ground coach and I think you can really see the, the fundamentals, the principles of play that he brings to the team in the way we play and the way it's so well grooved. But in changing the th middle three around, in terms of shape rather than personnel, I just think we lost that fluency and we lost that automatic knowledge of where to go. And that allied to Barnett stepping in and some players having individually poor games cause an issue. Let's have a look at those individuals. Howard was excellent, <laughs> letting five goals, but it wasn't for him. It could have been more. He made some good saves and again had some good delivery. So credit to Howard, that save at the end was massive. I would not have enjoyed the last three added minutes at 7-6. The back three, though, not so much, with the exception of Toza. I thought Toza had a very good game, actually. He really held things together. He made a lot of good challenges. But either side of him, like I said, Hayden, I love Hayden. I absolutely adore him. But he had a very rough game at the back. He scored the two goals, but... He had a lot of problems. Like I said, that, that first goal, it's so uncharacteristic of him to, to not make a powerful header clear. It was a routine one as well. Like I said, I think maybe trying to be too cute and find a teammate, but still, shouldn't have done it. And he, he did have a few nervous moments. I think the fact that the wide centre-backs were quite exposed because the shape didn't work in front of them was a big factor in what happened. But yeah, Hayden had a roughish time. Uh, and Clueth certainly got outmaneuvered a lot in terms of people getting around the side of him as well. So that side of the pitch was a real problem. A lot of the goals came from the left-hand side. So he and McFadgen, who both did pretty well on the ball, and neither of whom, I would say, really had problems in terms of their defensive plays, if you will, their engagements with attacking players. 
both maybe were caught out a bit positionally. Certainly, like I say, McFadden didn't track his runner for one of the goals. McFadden did very well going forwards. He was threatening. He put an excellent ball in for Mullen to win the penalty. Um, but I think he would have been a bit frustrated at, at the defensive side of the team on his side. Uh, Ford was, was solid defensively. There were very few issues down his side. And he looked good going forwards. So decent performance by him. In midfield... Young was terrific, battling away, leading, and really fighting to pull us black. Plus, he scored a screamer. O'Connor, like I said, a strange one. That I, I do think O'Connor desperately needs continuity in the team to really properly hit his rhythm. He's been in and out a lot with injuries, sadly. I think he's a massive signing, and I think he was brought in as a massive statement signing and just hasn't been able to get started yet. There were moments in the game, especially in the first half hour, where I thought his quality shone through. He's the most combative midfielder we have, I think. And he made some terrific saves. Attack it, tackles, beg your pardon. And he is an excellent passer of the ball with good touch. And he was receiving the ball well. And he made some lovely, intelligent little short passes to move play on. But he also did those things badly on occasion. He lost the ball sometimes with quite slack passes. He, in the first half, quite early on, got himself into a brilliant position. And his touch was, was horrible. And to me, that's... That surprised me because I think those are his strengths. So he was very up and down, and in the second half was fairly quiet. I rate O'Connor very highly, but I, that wasn't him at his best, I don't think, because I think he, he needs more games. Elliot Lee was terrific. <laughs> he was man of the match. I think no question about that. Didn't get any goals, but he was a constant threat. Some of the plays he made so such quality. Goodness me, you couldn't ask for more. He was popping around early on quite often on the left-hand side. He used that role behind the strikers just to have that freedom. But it actually is, I think, when he drives down the middle and has options moving in front of him that he's at his very best. And that was how he laid on Mullins' goal and his chance at the start of the second half. Brilliant from Lee. And so unlucky not to score a beauty with them when the keeper tipped his dipping shot over. That assist for Palmer, though. Oh, I think he may have worked out. I quite liked that. Up front, well, Palmer battled very hard and had sort of a frustrating game in a way. He had three-headed chances each time the defender backed into him well and he couldn't quite get on top of it. Two of them went a yard or so over. The third one, to be fair, sort of skimmed the bar. But he really worked hard occupying the defenders. He forced errors out of the defenders. So, in a way, he was a bit like our performance didn't quite look up to normal levels, but actually was effective. And he scored seven goals. And he did get his goal at the end, and he took it really well. So I think I may be being a little harsh on him there. Mullen, I was great. Kept chasing, kept battling, kept making those runs. Lee kept seeing them. Uh, scored, kept cool the penalty, of course, and took his goal beautifully well. High-class stuff from Mullen. It was good to see Hosanna come back on and he showed some good energy. He was really trying to, to get forwards and start the press high up the pitch when we lost the ball and I thought that was good. Um, Dolby had no chance to make any real impact. James Jones worked very hard. Did we miss his legs in midfield? I think maybe so. He certainly worked extremely hard without the ball, typically, trying to claim it back in those slightly edgy closing minutes. So, yeah, it was kind of crazy. But that's what Wrexham do now, isn't it? Crazy stuff. I mean, come on. You wouldn't want it any other way, would you? I wouldn't. With the final score, Wrexham 7, Barnet 5. I'm Mark Griffiths from Wrexham AFC.